Who co-owns the life insurance company? We do, the policy owner, right? So you, utilizing the life insurance company's money to get these projects going and to have that capital flowing back to the family, is that going to create an advantage for us while we're alive? And will it create an advantage for all the kids and the grandkids in the future? And this is the home that I grew up in, in Timmins, Ontario, 513 Martin Avenue. And this uh, picture is not what the house looked like in the mid seventies when my parents uh, had it built. It's been extensively renovated, but the reason I'm sharing this is because my parents lived through that very same time that Nelson did. And as I was growing up as a toddler, my parents argued all the time about money. They were always fighting about money. And my, my dad, my dad worked, um, really hard. He was always away from home. And the only time that I got to spend with him is if I joined him at work. There was no time at home with the family. He was always working. And so in the early 1980s, when inflation skyrocketed and my parents um, were already struggling financially, the response that my dad felt was best was to go out and work more. And so he was away from the home even more. And that was a really painful period of time in my life because I didn't understand really what was going on. And how many of you are familiar with the National Bank and their logo? That is permanently etched in my mind. I'll never forget. I'm standing, literally standing in the living room of our home. And my mom's seated on the couch. My dad is on his armchair. And my mom's opening this letter. And I'll, I can close my eyes and see it to this day. I remember the, the red logo on that envelope. And that was the notice from the bank. Get the mortgage caught up or get out of the house because we're going to foreclose. And I'll never forget my mom's expression when she read that letter and she looked up at me. She looked at my dad and my sister and she was just in, in tears. And she asked a question that I'll never forget. What kind of Christmas gift is this? There was nothing silver in, in, in our home. We grew up with no money. And my parents had nobody to mentor them, nobody. And when I relocated uh, from Timmins to Western Canada in August of 1998, at that time, my parents had already been separated for a number of years. And I was in my early 20s. And I'll just never forget the day that I left Timmins to move to Edmonton. And my dad said, I'm really proud of you. Um, I know that you're going to excel. You're going to do extremely well. Make sure, A, you don't get any speeding tickets on the drive to Edmonton. It was a three-day drive. And B, I need you to call me the moment that you get there so I know that you arrive safe and sound. So I left Timmins. I got pulled over just outside of Winnipeg on day two. Got a speeding ticket. I kid you not. And you ever seen the movie Dukes of Hazard? Well, this RCMP cruiser came flying out of the ditch. There's dirt flying everywhere, lights and sirens, SWAT team blowing down from the helicopter. And, and I, I got a speeding ticket and I got to Edmonton and I, I didn't call, uh, I didn't call home. I just got straight to work. And I picked up on uh, workaholism from my dad. It's a, it's a publicly accepted form of addiction. And I suffer from that. I, I'm still, I still work on it to this day and I'll always be working on it. And a few weeks into my, uh, my new life in Edmonton, I called home and uh, my stepmom, Beverly, answered the phone and I said, hey, can I talk to dad? And she said, oh, he's in the bathroom right now. Do you want to wait? And I said, well, I don't have a half an hour. Um, could you let him know I apologize because I knew he would demand an apology for getting the speeding ticket. So I said, I apologize in advance. I got a speeding ticket, but let him know I'm here. I'm safe. I'm sorry I didn't call sooner and let him know I love him and uh, I'm doing fine. She said, no problem. I'll pass along the message. So the very next morning, so I, was I had been recruited by Staples Business Depot right out of college. We're in the store. It's just before 11. And I get paged to pick up an urgent call, not just a call, an urgent call. So I pick up the call. It's my stepmom, Beverly, and she's frantic. And she said that my dad had just passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. He was gone. 
And I, I literally in that moment, I don't know if you've ever experienced that type of phone call or that type of unexpected news, but I was literally just frozen in that moment and I didn't know what to do. And so my, my uncle John called me shortly thereafter and he said, hey, there's an, uh, an airplane ticket waiting for you. We need you to get home to Timmins. You got to be there for the family. So I had to step up in my mid twenties and I had to, to step into the role of patriarch of the family. And when you're dealing with a circumstance where you have no life insurance, you have no idea what you're dealing with. You're trying to process the grief, which I just decided to tuck away in a filing cabinet and not deal with, right? I was macho. I was a macho man. My dad would have told me to suck it up. So that's what I decided to do. Worst mistake I ever made. When we started to have kids of our own, every special occasion, I was an emotional wreck. And my wife, Rebecca said, I think you need to go talk to somebody. Like you need, you need to go talk to somebody. And I did. And I was able to work on processing my grief. And I lost my mom uh, not too long after my dad passed. And my grief counselor said, I want you to write a letter to both your parents. And I want you to express everything that you would have said to them if you knew it was the last time you would, you'd be talking to them. So I went through this exercise. I shared with my uh, grief counselor. I said, I'm all done. And he said, no, you're not. He said, you're going to invite your family to the next grief counseling session and you're going to read those letters out loud to your family. And I did that. And of, uh, of course, as you can imagine, it was a tsunami of emotion. And I'll never forget it. I was seated on this, this couch. My family was all there with me. My grief counselor was right there next to me. And he leans into my ear and he asks, how you holding up? I said, I, I feel drained. He said, you, you, you felt it. Allow yourself to feel the grief. Don't, don't store it away. And that, and I share that because I hope that it just serves as a bit of inspiration for someone who's dealing with something so tragic. Don't put that away and leave it there. Deal with it. Let yourself feel it. My dad had a participating dividend paying whole life insurance contract. He retired. And when he retired, his financial advisor said, surrender the policy in exchange for the cash value because you don't need the insurance death benefit anymore. I'm going to meet that individual someday. I'm going to meet that person someday. And we're going to have a chat. Because that money, that tax-free death benefit would have come in extremely handy in that moment to be able to deal with everything that came after my father passed away and after my mom passed away. And one of our late mentors, Bob Shields, said something so poignant. He passed away in his 90th year and he said, I wish everyone could die once for a week and see the problems that they leave behind. I had no idea what infinite banking was when I lost both my parents. I had no idea and once we discovered this process, everything changed. And I made a solemn commitment to make sure that I taught my kids and that I taught my extended family all about this process and the significance of it. If I can do this, honestly, anybody can. And so regardless of what you've dealt with in your life or what you're dealing with now or what you may be dealing with in the future, you can do this. And once you know how, it's ridiculously simple. But you need a good coach. You need a good coach. And that's why all of our advisors on our team are authorized infinite banking practitioners with the Nelson Nash Institute. You would not be dealing with anybody in an advisory capacity on our team who's not authorized with the Institute. All of our team members, every team member practices this process in their own lives. They would not be a team member if they didn't practice this in their own lives. They cannot participate in profit sharing in our company unless they practice this process in their own lives. So that any person that you're dealing with on our team is speaking to you from a place of authenticity and they're acting in integrity. Isn't that good? This process is not about addressing the yield of an investment. It never has been, it never will be. Never has been, never will be. This process is all about where your money resides before you control how you finance the things that you need throughout your lifetime. Now on page three in Nelson's book, 
if I can invite everybody to turn to page three. And on page three, Nelson says, the whole idea is to recapture the interest that one is paying to banks and finance companies for the major items that we need during a lifetime, such as automobiles, major appliances, education, homes, investment opportunities, business equipment, etc. Everybody sees that in the book? Let's start with automobiles. These three vehicles are vehicles that we purchased using our family banking system. Now we're not talking about the vehicles that we also purchased and financed for other family members. I'm just describing our immediate family. This Odyssey, this Ford Explorer, this Nissan Altima, the total principal that was repaid to our family banking system was $148,000. The interest that we paid back to our family banking system was $40,674. If we had financed those car purchases through the dealership, we would have transferred all that money away from the family and we would have given up the opportunity to earn interest on all that money for the rest of my life, my kids' lives, their children's lives, and so on. If I would have paid cash for them using my own cash, I would have had to have stored the money in someone else's bank, withdraw that money to go buy the cars. So I end up with the car, but someone else's bank ended up with all my money, not only while I was accumulating it, but when I made the purchase as well. If I would have leased the vehicles, I would have made a payment for something that I would never own. That's even worse. And ask yourself this question, is the person who bought the vehicle that you lease stupid? If leasing is such a good thing? What's more important? The stream of payments and where the money's flowing to. Agreed? Now, after automobiles, what did Nelson say? Major what? Major appliances? Okay, this is a picture of our uh, kitchen and dining room in our home. These appliances, all these appliances were purchased. Principal repaid 45000 Interest paid 4837 What's the next item? Education. My son Jackson, uh, he attends Vimy Ridge. It's a, a sports school and academy. He's been playing hockey ever since he was a fetus. Loves the sport. Two years of tuition, two years of interest. All that money flowed back where? To our family banking system. What's the next item on the list? This is our family home. And right next door to our family home is my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law. We had this home built. Guess where the capital came from? Not from me. Where did it come from? The life insurance company. Who, who co-owns the life insurance company? We do. The policy owner, right? These properties, because I want my family close to me. I have a severe paranoia of loss. We've been having family dinner in our home every Sunday since April of 2008. And we have the whole family over. That is critical for me because I know that those phone calls are going to come again. I know that we're going to experience loss again. So I want to have as much time as possible with my family. So when we moved into our new home, I let my sister-in-law know, we're going to go ahead and have you move in next door. And she's like, well, uh, can we at least take a look at the lot or... <laughs> So you, utilizing the life insurance company's money to get these projects going and to have that capital flowing back to the family, is that going to create an advantage for us while we're alive? And will it create an advantage for all the kids and the grandkids in the future? That's good. What's the next item on the list? Investment opportunities, right? That was the next item on the list? Okay. All of these companies are part of the low family group of businesses. Where did the capital come from? No, I, I say that in humor because these are all private companies. So I have an, uh, obviously a fiduciary responsibility to not be disclosing what the financials are of those businesses, respecting our, our shareholders and partners. But the, the, this is multi eight figures in revenue that get generated from these companies. Where did the capital come from to get them going? Our system, our family banking system. All of these opportunities were opportunities of high caliber that tracked me down, not the other way around. I didn't go out looking for them. 
These are opportunities that found me. Isn't that good? Business equipment was the final item. This is uh, one of our uh, Canada prep and ship warehouses. All this product gets shipped to Amazon distribution centers in the United States to Americans who buy products that Canadians make that they can't buy. So we just, we're satisfying a demand. And so we got product, we got business equipment. Uh, to get this particular warehouse going, it was 200,000. And this is the amount as of February of this year that has been recaptured in interest that would have gone to someone else's system. So let's, let's tally this, but before we do that, let's go to page 21 in Nelson's book. And repetition is going to serve as a really powerful learning aid for us today, okay? Nelson said the very first principle that must be understood is that you finance everything that you buy. You either pay interest to someone else or you give up the interest you could have earned otherwise. The alternate use of money must always be reckoned with. Some call this opportunity cost, but it is amazing how people give lip service to this fact, but do not put it into practice in their own financial dealings. That's the equivalent of thinking that the law of gravity applies to everyone else but them. Everything that we do financially is accomplished by obeying Nelson's principles that he taught in this book. Everything that we do in our family banking system. We had the cars, principal and interest. We had the major appliances, principal and interest. Education, homes, investment opportunities, business equipment. There's the running total as of February all from shopping at home. Nelson said, you should be shopping at home for all the things that you need financially. Don't, don't shop outside the home. That's the language that we use with our children. You need to shop at home for the things that you need financially. Don't shop outside the home. Isn't that good? Nelson said, this was a picture of him and I in uh, Kelowna together, sitting down to lunch. And he said, Jason, what you have done is you've created perpetual motion in your family's financial world. We host annual family banking meetings. Isn't that cool? And Nelson said, you have to learn how to run a business. Once you understand the grocery store example, the rest of becoming your own banker is a piece of cake. This is my beautiful wife, Rebecca. She really administers the family banking system, does such an incredible job with it. Um, I just have to recognize her and honor her because um, without her, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you about this today. Ascendant wouldn't even exist. And we talked about, would you have much of a grocery store business if you were the only customer? This is a picture of one of our annual family banking meetings. And you can see all the kids are included in the family banking meeting. We talk about how we utilize the family banking system. Uh, we recognize repayment of policy loans. We talk about upcoming uses of the system, uh, what family members are gonna need money for, how we're gonna put that together, and so much more. And this is the most recent one uh, that we had. This was our first family vacation since COVID. And we had our family uh, banking meeting in Cancun. And uh, again, all of the children were involved and it was just an amazing, it was an incredible session. Now, you know how people always go and put their towels out at a resort on the, uh, on the chairs near the pool? So what I said to the kids each morning is I said, okay, if you get up before mom and dad and you want to go down to the pool, take your family banking t-shirt and put that down, not a towel, and watch what happens. <laughs> so my kids are like, okay, all right, we're going to do that. And then we go down to the pool and guess what people started asking? Annual family banking meeting? May I ask you what that is? My first question would always be, have you read this book? That's how it happens. Isn't that good? This is meant to be a system of policies. This is not meant to be achieved with the use of one policy. Okay, so that your system will grow gradually and incrementally over a period of time. In 2009, when we first uh, got our, our first policy approved, the number of policies that we had at the end of 09 were two. So there was a policy in place on Rebecca and my life jointly, which we would never do again but we did with our first policy and on the life of our son, Jackson, our firstborn. In February of 2022, 
we had 62 policies in our family banking system. And as, as of April 4th, when I did that talk in Florida, we had 63 policies and we have five uh, additional policies in underwriting with the insurance company right now. And this does not include external family members. My sister-in-law has policies on all of her kids. My brother-in-law has policies on all of his kids and so on. Those are not included in this number. The total premium by the end of 2009 was 16,800. As at the end of February, the pr total premium that we deposit into our system each year is $530,489 a year. And that number will eclipse 600,000 uh, before the end of August. The total death benefit in our family banking system in 2009 was a half a million. As of February, it's $30,701,000. As of April 4th, $31,045,000. Do you see a pattern? Just from February to April, do you see what's happening? I'm going to explain to you why that phenomenon is occurring at a much faster pace, okay? Total cash value at the end of 2009 was 4250 at the end of February, it was two million and uh, two thousand. At the end of April, it was two million three hundred thirty-five thousand. Do you see a pattern? And it could not go backward. When the stock market crashes, what happens to my cash value? It goes up. When the economy recedes, what happens to my cash value? It goes up. When tax rates rise, what happens to my cash value? It goes up. Cash value is capital. It's equity that's building up inside of your policy every day. That, that amount's not accessible because I have loan amounts outstanding. I'm getting to that, okay? 90% of that amount is accessible, just to give you an idea. Isn't that good? $300 in loans in the first year, we bought a car seat for my son, and we took a policy loan to do it. You can't get a policy loan for less than $500 now, but you could back then. That was our very first policy loan. And as of April 4th, 706,000 is the total policy loan balance in our system. Has that impacted any of our total cash value? Has that impacted any of our total death benefit? It keeps going up. The loan amount available at the end of 09 was 3,825. At the end of February, it was 1.8 million. At the end of April, it's 1.413 million. That's ready access money on demand on my terms to take advantage of opportunity that will track me down. Loan repayments back to our family banking system in the first year, $330. As of February of 2022, $26,000 a month is flowing back to our family banking system. As of April 4th, $40,000 a month is coming back to the family banking system. Does that take away, does that take away any of our options? Not at all. It's good. Now we've had two windfalls, meaning uh, the payment of death benefit proceeds in the family banking system. So this gentleman that you see here is, uh, his name uh, was Larry. We uh, named him Papa because of all the, uh, his nine grandkids named him, called him Papa. And so Larry worked, uh, he spent his entire career with the Edmonton Police Service. And when he retired, shortly after he retired, uh, we sat down and had a conversation. And I said, um, so Papa, we'd like to take out uh, a couple of um, life insurance contracts with you as the life insured. I'll pay the premium. So you, you're not going to come out of pocket one penny. And he said, well, I'm type two diabetic. I don't know that I'm insurable. I said, well, why don't we find out? So we put him through underwriting. He got approved. We purchased uh, two policies on, on his life. And I said, Papa, all that we need to do is get you through underwriting. I'll pay all the premium. God forbid, uh, when you pass away, and we had anticipated that he was gonna live a very long time. We had no expectation that he was gonna pass away anytime soon. When that day comes, Nona, Papa's wife, so Nona, you'll never have another bad financial day for the rest of your lifetime. 
we'll take care of everything. And Papa, the only thing that I expect in return is to be reimbursed for the premium that I paid into the policy. And while you're alive, the policy is going to form a part of the family banking system. So it's going to be utilized for all those things that I described earlier. And Papa said, great. Sounds good to me. So we had the policies in force for uh, several years. And in September of 2020, uh, he passed away after a five-week battle with cancer. He was diagnosed on day one, and at week five, he was gone. And I had a conversation with him three days before he passed, shared with him that, you know, everything uh, that was promised uh, would be fulfilled and that Nona would be fine. And uh, that Saturday evening, he passed away. And then um, we, since then, we've honored his legacy. Uh, the, the other component of that that I didn't share is that part of the death benefit proceeds were used to purchase policies on all nine of his grandkids and be fully funded uh, for a minimum of 10 years. And that was part of Papa's legacy for the grandkids. That doesn't show up anywhere on a policy illustration. You're not going to find that in the numbers anywhere. This picture was taken on a family uh, vacation. We, we take family vacations once a year, and those are paid for courtesy of the life insurance company's money. And we take everybody. And in this, the reason this picture is, is so significant in my memory is there's Papa and all of the kids. So I, I'm seated here and all of the kids were approaching me before dinner. And my daughters love to do that. They give me a kiss on both cheeks. And so all the kids were doing that. All of them. And so Papa comes up to me and he, and, uh, cause I said, all right, Papa, why don't you grab a seat here? And he goes, no, you, you sit there. And so I sat down and I'll never forget it. He leaned into my ear and he said, you see all those kids? I said, yep. He said, they love you and they care for you. You're the godfather of the family now. Long before he was diagnosed with cancer, long before he passed away, he said, it's your responsibility to lead the family. And I said, okay. And now I sit at the head of the table. Every single person you see in this photograph is injured several times over. Nelson said that what, you, what happens in the policy illustration is the scene. You can look at that. You can look at numbers. What you do with it outside the policy illustration is the unseen. And if you're a life insurance agent, I want you to read that again. Because agents get really focused on illustrations, policy designs, all that stuff. That's the scene. This is an illustration full of numbers. The policy is just a tool. You can put the best tool for the job in the hands of an incompetent, and not only will that person not turn out any good work with the tool, they'll likely break the damn tool. You're starting a business from scratch. You need a coach to lead you through how to get the business off the ground profitably and keep it there. Infinite banking concepts is a process. It's not a product. Here's the unseen. This uh, is a description of a policy, one of 63 policies in the family banking system. I put 20,000 a year into that policy. I started putting 20,000 a year into that policy in October of 2012. In that year, my twin daughters were born. We thought we were having number three and my wife showed up at my office one day. And I look at my office door and I could see the silhouette of Rebecca. And I opened the door and I hadn't heard from her. She had visited the doctor and by, by baby number three, Rebecca was saying, you don't have to come with me to any of the doctor's appointments. We got this. We're good. Well, I hadn't heard from her. I was a little worried. And so I see her silhouette and I, I opened the door and I said, oh, I, I was, I was worried about you. I hope everything's okay. She's got a bottle of red wine in one hand and a CD in a case when you still, you know, we still used CDs and she hands me both. She goes, this red wine's for you. And I want you to know there's two in here. And I said, what? So I put the CD in the computer and, and the, the graphic of, of the twins, it, it read baby A, baby B. Well, right away, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy. Well, all the gals came in from the office, not a dry eye in my office. Everybody's crying 
tears of happiness and joy. And I was like, oh, this is so good. So I, I call one of my mentors. I said, I'm having twins. And he goes, make sure you get policies in place on both of them the moment they're born. I said, okay, I promise I'll do that. And so that's when Caitlin and Charlotte came along. And in 2013, a dividend was paid on the policy. In 2014, a dividend was paid again. We took a family vacation. In 2015, another dividend paid. We purchased the Honda Odyssey. 2016, another dividend paid. 2017, another dividend paid. We purchased the Ford Explorer. 2018, took a family vacation, another dividend paid. 2019, another family vacation, another dividend paid. 2020, COVID hits, another dividends paid, no family vacation. 2021, dividend paid, and we purchased the Nissan Altima. The reason you're looking at a tree stump is I want you to think about this really important lesson that Nelson taught me so long ago. He sent me a picture of a tree stump with his feet. You can see his feet in the picture, and he's kind of looking down at the tree stump. And he said, I want you to use this in your boot camps. So I called him and I said, what? I, I'm coachable. What, what inspired you to, to send this to me? He said, well, I want you to think about this. When a policy starts, it begins right here. And then he asked, what does each ring represent in, on, a, on a tree? It rep yes, it does. In cash value growth. But in Mother Nature, it represents one year of uninterrupted growth, right? And then he asked me a question. He said, have you ever seen a tree contract? I said, no. He goes, can a policy contract? I said, no. He said, do you understand where I'm going with this? I said, yeah. He said, every ring represents the uninterrupted growth that's happening inside the policy. It's inconsequential that the spaces in between each ring are closer or farther apart. It's the circumference that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, who in this case, not with my policy, but in this tree stump photo that Nelson sent me, this was a tree that was cut down from his backyard. Who killed the tree? The owner, right? So his next question was, who's the only person that can kill the banking business? The owner. So whose behavior is more important? The policy owner or the insurance company? The policy owner. This is how Nelson taught. That was part of his brilliance. He said, we're taking the financial energy away from outside lenders and redirecting it into our own family banking system. The more we do that, the more capacity we create. This is the outside lender. <laughs> and this is you. <laughs> okay, here's one of the key teaching points. And I want you to think about this tree stump example in the policy that I just referenced. So on page 15, bottom right hand corner, Nelson says, it all reminds me of a phenomenon in physics. Take a pail of water to the seaside. I want you at sea level. I want you to heat it up to 210 degrees Fahrenheit and all you have is very hot water. But if you heat it up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, you have live steam with unbelievable power. The steam engine changed the world, but it doesn't happen until you get past 212 degrees. Lots of heat goes into the process up to the boiling point, but the dramatic power comes suddenly. When I started that one policy in 2012, and I was putting 20,000 a year into that policy, that's the pail of water, that's the, the pot of water at seaside. And the, the premium, the premium is the energy, the fire. The pot of water starts filling up with what? Cash value. Okay, I want you to think about this. When we get to 210 degrees, so we're about five, six years into paying premium, all that we have is a pot of really hot water. That's what someone would conclude. They, they would look and go, oh, all you've got is a pot of hot water. But once this policy got to year seven, 212 degrees, I created live steam. I put 20,000 in premium into that policy last October. The cash value increase was 28,672. This is inflation. This is me. 
you've got to follow Nelson Nash's second golden rule. Don't be afraid to capitalize your system because your money has to reside somewhere. But when you start your policy and you put your first premium in, your second premium in, your third premium in, you're heating up that pot of water. You're getting it up to 210 degrees. Once you pass over that milestone, and it happens in every single policy, it doesn't matter whether you're putting $100 of premium in or you're putting 1,000 or 100,000, it doesn't matter. The policy will achieve the milestone where every dollar of premium you pay in creates far more than a dollar of accessible capital. That's live steam. And believe me, when that time comes in your system, oh my God, you're going to feel really good. That particular policy, the $20,000 deal, total premium deposited in 2012 was 20,000. In 2022 is 200,000 is the cumulative premium that's been deposited. Total death benefit started at 721,000. It grew to 1.114 million as of February. It's much higher today. Total cash value was 4,500 at the end of year one. It's 220,948 and rising daily. So did I completely cost neutralize the policy? Is it totally cost neutralized? Is that good for a corporate owner, a business owner? You like cost neutrality and you wanna get there as quickly as possible. This is a very inefficient policy design, but that's all we had to work with at the time. It would be the complete inverse now. The minimum premium today would be 5,000 and the additional deposit option would be 15. Back then it was a total opposite. So anybody looking at this today will go, wow, that's an incredibly inefficient policy. That's all we had to work with at the time. Am I complaining about it now? <laughs> Not a chance. You remember all the vacations, the, the, the cars, everything that flowed through this policy? Loan balance in 2012 was zero. Uh, today it's also zero. Loan amount available 4,050 after year one, 198,000 as of February. It's much higher as of June. 28,843 increase in total cash value. H how am I doing? And the dividend this year is going to buy $30,000 more of paid up additions to the total death benefit. And the cash value of the policy must equal the total death benefit by age 100. So what's happening to my cash value every single day that I'm aging closer to 100? It keeps going up. And if the death benefit keeps bumping up rapidly and I keep aging, what must happen to the speed at which that cash value grows? It's got to go faster because the cash value is on the ladder. The death benefit's way up there. And the cash value goes, I'm going to get you. And the death benefit goes, not a chance. Keeps going higher. Regardless of what's happening in the stock market, the economy, with politicians, with taxes, with inflation, with loss of benefits, with longevity, your aquarium of capital keeps growing every day, uninterrupted. And the only person who can kill that business is you. And so if you are active in this process, and you're accessing policy loans and you're not paying them back and, and you get to a point where you say, I can't pay my loans back and I can't pay my premium, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is point this where? Away from you. It's someone else's fault. Well, how many fingers are pointing back towards you? This, Nelson said it very clearly in his book. Don't you go, don't you dare go blaming anybody else. If you mess up this business, that's on you. If you want to be in a position of control, you also assume the responsibility that comes along with being in a position of control. So don't kill the very business that you're trying to grow for this generation and the next and the next. Be an honest banker. When you request loans, pay them back and pay them back with more capital than what the insurance company you co-own calls for. And you'll create more advantage. Isn't that good?